Hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to another episode of Archive 5. So if you haven't seen one of these before, basically I take five unreleased videos, merge them all together into one, and Bob's your uncle. So there are going to be timestamps on the screen and also in the description below if you want to skip to any one of these reviews. And today I'm going to be reviewing five more of the Penguin Mini Modern Classics. So the books we're going to be taking a look at today are The Legend of the Sleepers by Dan Locus. The Black Ball by Ralph Ellison. Till September Petronella by Jean Rhys. Investigations of a Dog by Franz Kafka. And Daydream and Drunkenness of a Young Lady by Clarice Lispector. So those are the five books. There we have it. Let's go. Well, Today I'm, I'm watching well, Helene Jepsen. She's doing her reading vlog. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to do a quick review of The Legend of the Sleepers by Danilo Kiss. So, I think that's how you pronounce it, who knows? So this is number 11 in the Penguin Mini Modern series. I will read you the blurb as per usual. So it says, Sleepers awake in a remote cave, and the ancient mystic Simon Magus attempts a miracle. And these two magical, otherworldly tales from one of the greatest voices of 20th century Europe. I was expecting there to be more to that sentence, but there wasn't, so that's why I may have read that a little bit oddly. And on the inside it says, For there had once been false idols and asses' heads drawn on the walls. And I think that tells you everything you need to know about this book. I didn't like it. The problem with it is, is it's basically just the Bible, except not the Bible, if that makes sense. It was like reading the Bible, but I would have rather have just read the Bible. And I'm not religious. So... I don't even know what you... I mean, it calls them magical otherworldly tales. It's not magical and otherworldly. It's, it's biblical, basically, is what it reads like. It kind of reminded me a little bit as well of, say, something like The Odyssey. Except I really enjoyed The Odyssey. Whereas with this, it was just like pulling teeth. And I'm just re like reading through and I'm just like, oh, I'm really not interested. So this is... Uh, he was Yugoslavian and he died in Paris, France. Uh, it's translated by Michael Henry Heim, revised by Mark Thompson, apparently. And apparently these were both published in the Encyclopedia of the Dead, 1983. Which also, I guess, tells you everything you need to know about it. Like, for example, the legend of the sleepers here, each of the first four paragraphs starts with the line, They lay on their backs. I'm going to read you a bit to give you a vibe for it, I guess. They lay on their backs on rough, damp hair cloth that was somewhat mildewed from the humidity and had worn through in places from their movements, their twitching, their bones wherever their bodies were in contact with the camel hair, at the back of their head, at shoulder blades and elbows, near a protruding pelvis, beneath heels and calves rigid as distaffs. They lay on their backs with their hands crossed in prayer like corpses, on damp and rotting hair cloth that had worn thin beneath their bodies from the rare unconscious twitching of weary sleepers, sleepers weary of life and movement, but sleepers nonetheless, for their limbs did move, though imperceptibly to the human eye, and the hair cloth beneath them had worn thin in places where it had been pressed against the rock of the cave by the weight of their sleep and their stone-like bodies, where it had been exposed to the stirring of human clay, the chafing of bones on the dank hair cloth, and their hair cloth rubbing on the diamantine rock of the cave. They lay on their backs in the tranquil repose of great sleepers, but the movements of their limbs in the darkness of time wore thin the wet hair cloth beneath them, gnawing at the fibres of the camel hair, which were abraded imperceptibly, as when water coupled with time begins to bore into the hard heart of stone. They lay on their backs in a dark cave on Mount Celius. It's making me want to lie on my back and go to fucking sleep. His stone-like body, his torpid limbs still stretched out on the frayed hair cloth whose moisture he did not feel. Dionysus painfully separates the fingers of his crossed hands, fingers so stiff from sleep and immobility that they seem to have grown together, and he remembers his body and his bodily existence, remembers his heart which, lo, has come alive in him, as had his innards and his lungs and his eyes sealed by the lead of sleep and his member, cold and sleeping, as distant as sin was distant from him. Jesus. As well, it's one of these where there are virtually no... There's like no dialogue until we get to this bit where it just repeats, Oh thou who art blessed, thou shalt stand before the emperor. I mean, I guess maybe you would get more from this if you were in any way religious, maybe? I don't know. I like. I'm sure that if I were to look online, I could find some reading notes that would explain to me exactly what this is, you know, supposed to be about. I'm sure there's some deeper meaning to it and all of this stuff. But equally, 
I don't care about the deeper re like the deeper meaning of it. I'm I'm not spiritual or whatever. So for me, for, for if this is meant to be a holy book or something, fair enough. But if it's not meant to be a holy book, what is it meant to be? I don't understand. I don't understand what the point of this is. Like why? Uh, what what's I don't understand what the author was meant to be trying to achieve with it and what I as a reader am supposed to get from it And like I say I can probably look that up online But for me if I have to look that up then what is the point of the book if it only makes sense if you read the spark notes Then you might as well only have the spark notes we, here. We have part 19 of the legend of the sleepers He lay in the darkness of the cave. There's a lot of people just lying around waiting and stuff in it as well There's no plot to this whatsoever. There's no dialogue either he lay in the darkness of the cave, vainly straining his eyes, vainly calling to his friend Malchus, vainly calling to John, the saintly shepherd, vainly calling to the green-eyed dog, Quipmir, vainly calling to the Lord, his God. The darkness was as thick as tar, the silence, the silence of the tomb of eternity. All he could hear was the dripping of water from invisible vaults, the grinding of eternity and the clepsydra of time. Oh, who can divide dream from reality, day from night, night from dawn, memory from illusion? Who can draw a sharp line between sleep and death? Who, O oh Lord, can draw a sharp dividing line between present, past and future? Who, O oh Lord, can separate the joy of love from the sadness of memory? Happy are they who hope, O oh Lord, for their hopes shall be fulfilled. Happy are they who know what is day and what is night, O oh Lord, for they shall revel in the day and revel in the night and the repose thereof. Happy are they for whom the past has been, the present is and the future will be, O oh Lord, for their lives shall flow like water. Happy are they who dream by night and recall their dreams by day, O Lord, for they shall rejoice. Happy are they who know by day where they have been at night, O Lord, for theirs is the day and theirs is the night. Happy are they who recall not their nocturnal wanderings, O Lord, for theirs shall be the light of day. Oh, and then we have Simon Magus, which is the story after this, which is, is slightly better, I must admit. It's still very biblical, though, so I still didn't enjoy it that much, but at least the second one... There's kind of a plot to it. The first one is like just reading random religious rantings without any context. The second one is like reading a sort of biblical inspired short story, I guess. So the second story rescued it a bit. But he still went on a bit. I'm going to read you this, this sample here. Philosophizing is easier than flying, I admit, said Simon, with sorrow in his voice. Even you know how to chatter, though never once in your miserable life have you wrenched yourself so much as a foot off the ground. And now let me collect my strength and my thoughts and concentrate with everything I have on the horror of our earthly existence, on the imperfection of the world, on the myriad lives torn asunder, on the beasts that devour one another, on the snake that bites a stag as it grazes in the shade, on the wolves that slaughter sheep, on the mantises that consume their males, on the bees that die after they sting, on the mothers who labour to bring us into the world, on the blind kittens children toss into rivers, on the terror of the fish in the whale's entrails, and the terror of the beaching whale, on the sadness of an elephant dying of old age, on the butterfly's fleeting joy, on the deceptive beauty of the flower, on the fleeting illusion of a lover's embrace, on the horror of spilt seed, on the impotence of the ageing tiger, on the rotting of teeth in the mouth, on the myriad dead leaves lining the forest floor, on the fear of the fledging when its mother pushes it out of the nest, on the infernal torture of the worm baking in the sun as if roasting in living fire, on the anguish of a lover's parting, on the horror known by lepers, on the hideous metamorphoses of women's breasts, on wounds, on the pain of the blind. So as you can tell, it's pretty overwritten and wordy. I don't know, I just can't imagine myself ever wanting to read any more Danilo Kiss. It's just really not for me. Like I said, that second story does save it somewhat, but overall, rating time, I'm still going to give it... I'm going to give it a 2.5 out of 5, and I'm probably going to round it down to 2 when I put it on Goodreads and Amazon. I just... No, this wasn't for me. And actually, as I was reading this and, like, forcing myself to read it, I was like, why am I doing this? Why am I reading these Penguin Mini Moderns? Because the problem is, is that you, because I'm reading the whole box set, I don't get to choose, like... You know, for, like this, I probably wouldn't have picked up anyway. But I did because it's part of the box set and I didn't enjoy it. So anyway, 
On that note, that's what I thought of The Legend of the Sleepers by Daniel Kiss. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of his work and if so, what you think. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this, hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Black Ball by Ralph Ellison. So this is Penguin Mini Modern number 12. I will read you the blurb from the back. Stories of belonging and alienation, violence and beauty, racial injustice and unexpected kindness from a writer of soaring emotion and lyricism. So I went into this pretty much blind just because it's part of the Penguin Mini Moderns collection and I'm pleased to say I did very much enjoy it. I knew nothing about Ralph Ellison going in. Turns out he's like an own voices black American writer. So all of these stories were kind of about racial, well as it said racial injustice but from a black guy living in America in, you know, the 1950s. So, in fact, what were his dates? Let me check his dates. Born 1914, Oklahoma City. Died 1994, New York City. And uh, the stories in this are taken from Flying Home and Other Stories, first published in 1996, which would be posthumous. But... Just because that's when it's published, it doesn't mean that's when they necessarily take place. It's almost like reading, like, memories, or even, like, racial memories, so not necessarily stuff that's happened to Ralph Ellison, but stuff that's happened to black Americans and that he's heard about, and that, you know, it sticks with you if you're a victim of prejudice, or at least I assume it does. I mean, I was always bullied at school for being a bit weird, and that stuck with me and just made me more determined to be weird, I suppose. So I can imagine the same would apply if you're a black guy and you witness and you hear about all of these atrocities. It's just going to make you more determined to stand up for what's right. It says here in the front cover in the quote, it says, If he only knew what it was, he would fix it. He would kill this mean thing. So I will take you through some of the different stories. We start off with Boy on a Train. I think this, this paragraph here is a pretty good example of Ellison's style and also the kind of subject matter of these stories. So he says, one of the men on the platform was picking his teeth and spitting tobacco juice on the ground. The station was painted green, and a sign on the side read, Chew Bro's Snuff and showed a big white flower. It didn't look like a rose though. It was hot, and the men had their shirts open at the collar and wore red bandanas around their necks. They were standing in the same position when the train pulled out, staring. Why, he wondered, did white folks stare at you that way? Yeah, so he's on this train with his mama. And uh, his mama grabs him and she says, James, son, that old silo back there has been here a long time. It made me remember when years ago me and your daddy came over this same old Rock Island line on our way to Oklahoma City. We had just been married and was very happy going west because we had heard that coloured people had a chance out here. Shout out to Lonnie Donegan there. I think there's some interesting bits here about the relationship between... I suppose between African Americans and with God, although you could extrapolate it and, and it could be with any... Not, not even just Americans, with anyone with any relationship with God, really. Which I don't have a relationship with God. I am non-religious. Now Mama was pulling him close to her. The baby rested against her other side. This was familiar. Since Daddy died, Mama prayed with him, and now she was beginning to pray. He bowed his head. Go with us and keep us, Lord. Then it was me and him, Lord. Now it's me and his children. And I'm thankful, Lord. You saw fit to take him, Lord, and it's well with my soul in thy name. I was happy, Lord. Life was like a mockingbird a-singing. And all I ask now is to stay with these children, to raise them and protect them, Lord, till they're old enough to go their way. Make them strong and unafraid, Lord. Give them strength to meet this world. Make them brave to go where things is better for our people, Lord. James sat with his head bowed. Always when Mama prayed, he felt tight and smouldering inside. And he kept remembering his father's face. He could not remember Daddy ever praying, but Daddy's voice had been deep and strong when he sang in the choir on Sunday mornings. James wanted to cry, but, vaguely, he felt something should be punished for making Mama cry. Something cruel had made her cry. He felt the tightness in his throat becoming anger. If only he knew what it was, he would fix it. He would kill this mean thing that made Mama feel so bad, says our quote from the front cover. It must have been awful, because Mama was strong and brave, and even killed mice when the white woman she used to work for only raised her dress and squealed like a girl, afraid of them. If only he knew what it was. Was it God? It says here as well. James was miserable. He did not like to see Mama cry, and turned his eyes to the window as she began wiping away the tears. He was glad she was through now, because the butcher would be coming back into the car in a few minutes. He did not want a white man to see Mama cry. Here we go, we have a, a paragraph here that dates it. So this story took place in 1924. We've got a story here called Jaime's Bull. We have a, quite a long paragraph here. This is actually the opening paragraph I'm going to read out to you. 
We were just drifting, going no place in particular, having long ago given up hopes of finding jobs. We were just knocking around the country, just drifting, ten black boys on an L&N freight. From Birmingham we had swung up to the World's Fair at Chicago, where the bull had met us in the yards and turned us around and knocked a few lumps on our heads as souvenirs. If you've ever had a bull stand so close you can't miss, and hit you across the rump as you crawled across the top of a boxcar, and when you tried to get out of the way because you knew he had a gun as well as a loaded stick, you've had him measure a tender spot on your head and let go with his loaded stick like a man cracking black walnuts with a hammer, and if, when you started to climb down the side of the car because you didn't want to jump from the moving train like he said, you've had him step on your fingers with his heavy boots and grind them with his heel like you'd do a cockroach, and then, if you didn't let go, he beat you across the knuckles with his loaded stick till you did let go, and when you did, you hit the cinders and found yourself tumbling and sliding on your face, away from the train, faster than the telegraph poles alongside the tracks. Then you can understand why we were glad as hell we only had a few lumps on the head. Especially when you remember that the Chicago Bulls hate black bums about as much as Texas Slim, who'll kill a negro as quick as he'll crack down on a blackbird sitting on a fence. I don't know, I just thought that was very telling, but also really depressing, but it's telling of how cruel people can be, you know. Here we have The Black Ball, which is the titular story. I actually think out of all these stories, Boy on a Train was probably my favourite, but they were all very good. We have this bit in The Black Ball where this uh, white guy meets the black guy and uh, and he offers him a cigarette, the white guy does, and uh, he says, Not used to anything like that, are you? Not used to what? A little more from this guy and I would see red. Fellow like me offering a fellow like you something besides a rope. I stopped to look at him. He stood there smiling with a sack in his outstretched hand. There were many wrinkles around his eyes and I had to smile in return. In spite of myself, I had to smile. I would say the black ball is a good story for if you're a fan of To Kill a Mockingbird because of how he gets these scars. So this guy has scars all over, this white guy he has scars all over his, his hands and his face. And this is where he tells how he got them. Well, I got them scars in Macon County, Alabama, for saying a coloured friend of mine was somewhere else on a day he was supposed to have raped a woman. He was, too, because I was with him. Me and him was trying to borrow some seed 50 miles away when it happened, if it did happen. They made them scars with a gasoline torch and run me right out the country because they said I tried to help a nigg- no, no, I'm not going to say that word. Make a white woman out a lie. That same night they lynched him and burned down his house. They did that to him and this to me and both of us was 50 miles away. I mean, I think stories like that, they're just so powerful. You forget that there was a time when stuff like this actually happened, you know. Especially for me as a white- well, I'm working class, although I guess I'm middle class now, but a white British guy, you know, I, we, we never had, like, the KKK and lynchings and all this stuff. That was all very much overseas. Oh, yeah, so the point behind this black ball, basically this white kid asks the black kid to borrow his ball, and the black kid gives him the ball because you, that's what you do if you're a black kid in this, the time this is set, you know, you don't have much choice about it. And then the white kid throws it through a window and the black kid gets all the blame. Like, ah, oh, man, when it says racial injustice, racial injustice, indeed, like, it will make your blood boil reading this, but in a good way. And basically, this guy makes some comment about it being a black ball, and the kid is like, but, but my ball is white. Yes, son, I said, your ball is white. Mostly white, anyway, I thought. Will I play with the black ball, daddy? In time, son, I said, in time. He had already played with the ball, that he would discover later. He was learning the rules of the game already, but he didn't know it. Yes, he would play with the ball. Indeed, poor little rascal. He would play until he grew sick of playing. My, yes, the old ball game. But I'd begin telling him the rules later. And then finally, we have In a Strange Country. And this is set in Wales, which was interesting. I believe it was during the Second World War, and there were like these African-American servicemen in Wales. And basically, they got the kind of vibe of this story is they got accepted a lot more in Wales and actually this African-American dude he was a bit shy to join in with all the Welsh when they were singing all of their songs and he ends up singing the national anthem of America you know the Star, Star Spangled Banner and it's a very emotional moment for him and for me actually as well I kind of contrasted that with with Jimi Hendrix playing the Star Spangled Banner at the Isle of Wight festival or whatever he did because here this guy sings it and for him it like knocks him out and he I don't know, I, you have to read it really to understand the message and possibly you have to be an American to truly understand it but he's kind of overtaken by the emotion of, of singing the Star Spangled Banner and you know what it means for him as a black serviceman in 1940s or whatever to, to be patriotic you know I like this little quote so we're talking about the different people who are singing Do you see that fellow with the red face there? asked Mr Catty Yes Our leading mine owner And what are the others? Everything. The tenor on the end is a miner. Mr. Jones in the centre there is a butcher. 
and the dark man next to him is a union official. You'd never think so from their harmony, he said, smiling. When we sing, we are Welshmen, Mr. Catty said as the next number began. He liked these Welsh. Not even on the ship where the common danger and a fighting union made for a degree of understanding did he approach white men so closely. So yeah, all in all, as you can probably tell from the way I've been talking about this, I really enjoyed this. This is The Black Ball by Ralph Ellison. I think if you want any kind of... I mean, this is basically modern classic diverse reading, you know. I just think very fascinating, very well written, really a pleasure to read. I mean, don't get me wrong, it does make your blood boil at the injustices, but it does also make you think as well, and that's what I kind of want from a book like this. So I'm going to give this a 4.5 out of 5. It's very good, and I will hopefully be reading some more Ralph Ellison. So yeah, if you've never read any of his stuff, check out The Black Ball. And on that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this or indeed if you've read any Ralph Ellison. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe if you're new here and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Hi guys, Dane here. And today I want to do a quick review of Till September Petronella by Jean Rhys. So this is Penguin Mini Modern number 13. As always, I will read the blurb. Four searing stories of women, lost, adrift, down but not quite out, that span the course of a lifetime, from a Caribbean childhood to ruinous adulthood to old age and beyond. So, I mean, I guess that's an accurate description, but what it fails to convey is that the women in these stories are so mind-bogglingly dull <laughs> that it's just no fun to read about them. Like, I don't know, don't get me wrong, I'm all for stories about women, and I think that there should be more of them, especially by women you know, about women, but I don't think it, <laughs> I don't think it does any favours when, like, you know, you know Miss Marple, you know how boring Miss Marple would be if she didn't solve crimes, like, the fact that she solves crimes is almost, like, <laughs> the, you know, the exciting part that clashes with the rest of her really dull personality, she, apart from that, she's just like a little old lady who likes knitting, you know, yeah, all four of these stories, I mean, they left very little lasting impression, I couldn't tell you the names of any of the women that they were about, so, I guess they, they weren't particularly strong women, I guess. I, I don't know. The quote in the front says, I knew he was imagining a really lovely girl, all curves, curls, heart and hidden claws. I mean, I suppose part of this is that, actually, again, I think a lot of the way that these stories are presented, it, it explores the women, like, through their, the way they are with blokes, if that makes sense. So, for example, that quote there, you know, I knew he was imagining a really lovely girl. Well, that's immediately, that actually puts the emphasis on what some dude is imagining rather than upon what the girl herself is, you know. That kind of felt like this throughout. The These women were only the people they were because of their social situations, their social standing or the way they interact with people. And it, they didn't feel like fully fledged women in and of themselves, you know. I mean, I tried to highlight some of the bits that I did enjoy. And as you can see, I've highlighted, I think, five pages. I usually do about 30 pages in these. So, for example, one of the things I did enjoy was this quote. You must drink slowly, he would say. For if you're very thirsty and you drink quickly, you die. She talks about a book. She says, I knew that this book was the most important thing that had ever happened to me. And I did not want anyone to be there when I looked at it. But I was very disappointed because it was in French and seemed dull. For Com L'Amour, it was called. Which I don't know what that means. Something, something, death, I think. Here comes death? I don't know. But that was the end line of the story. So I, it, I think it kind of relies on you knowing what that means. And the significance of that, I guess. That was actually from a story called The Day They Burned the Books. Which was basically Fahrenheit 451. I don't know when it was written. So it's basically Fahrenheit 451. Except published 15 years after Fahrenheit 451. So no marks for originality on that story there. Okay, the, the plot of that story is about somebody burning books and then they take a book home with them. That's Fahrenheit 451. <laughs> then we have the title story, Till September Petronella. I literally, I, I have no memory of this at all. It just went in through one eye and out the other eye, I guess. I don't know what's the, I don't know what the bookish term or bookish equivalent of that is. Well, they have this conversation. Aren't people swine? Julius, Julian says, I never think. He's wrong. Sometimes I think quite a lot. The other day I spent a long time trying to decide which were worse, men or women. I wonder. Women are worse. They'll kick your face to bits if you let them and shriek with laughter at the damage. But I'm not going to let them. Oh no. From what I read on the back of this, this was suggested it was going to be some sort of, I don't know, some sort of feminist text. And I mean, this could easily have been written by a rich old white man. Like, maybe it was. Maybe Jean Reese is not a woman. 
Oh, that's right as well, because, she, yeah, no, she's a Caribbean woman. So, I guess, but then that, that kind of annoys me, though, because then I wonder whether this was only included in the collection because she was a, a woman of Caribbean descent, writing at a time when not many women of Caribbean descent were. I mean, don't get me wrong, that's very admirable, but it doesn't mean the stories are any good. And they're not. <laughs> I don't know, I just felt really frustrated with this book. We have this bloke here, and he says, uh, I'd like to feel that when I go to town, there's a friend I could see and have a good time with. You know, and I could give her a good time too. By God, I could. I know what women like. You do? Yes, I do. They like a bit of loving. That's what they like, isn't it? I guess that's the equivalent of when people today go, in it. So he was like, yeah, I do. They like a bit of loving. That's what they like, innit? Bit of loving. All women like that. They like it dressed up sometimes and sometimes not. It all depends. You have to know. And I know. I just know. You've nothing more to learn, have you? Oh, no, that's the girl. I can't keep doing the voices because I can't. I've lost track of who's who. Oh, yeah, they like pretty dresses and bottles of scent and bracelets with blue stones in them. I don't know. Maybe that is what women want. I don't know. I, I, I think... I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what women want. I don't pretend to know what women want. It was very dull. It was very, very dull. And even... Going back through it now, I can't really remember what any of the stories are about. I get that. I remember that first one because I remember thinking while I read it, this is just Fahrenheit 451. And then the second one was the really long one, which is the title story in this collection, which I don't remember. The other stories are Rapunzel, Rapunzel, which I don't remember. And I used to live here once, which I think was about somebody going back to a house they used to live at and knocking on the door. But I remember thinking with that, I mean, it's very short. I think it's only, yeah, it's that. And so I just remember thinking that's actually quite a good concept that has been taken nowhere. So all in all, I don't know, I don't get it. Perhaps it's just me. I mean, I'm probably not the target audience, but I would have thought the whole point of having a box set of all 50 of them is that they that it's a collection that's supposed to transcend target audience, you know? And really, I, I don't know why you would read this or enjoy it i mean i don't know maybe if you were a caribbean woman it makes more sense but it it did but like i say it's it read as though it'd been written by an old white guy so so there's that i don't know yeah anyway it's rating time i'm gonna give it i think i, I think i gave it a 2.5 out of 5 but looking back it's definitely it's a 2 out of 5 i i don't i just i just don't i can't even so yeah so anyway, that's what I thought of Till September Petronella by Jean Reese. Let me know in the comments what you think if you've read this book. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Hi guys, Dane here. And today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Investigations of a Dog by Franz Kafka. So this is Penguin Mini Modern number 14. I'm going to read you the blurb as always. So how does a dog see the world? How do any of us? In this playful and enigmatic story of a canine philosopher, Kafka explores the limits of knowledge. And inside we have, as usual, a little quote. So the quote in this one is, We dogs are an odd lot. So this is translated by Michael Hoffman. It's uh, originally published in 1922. So, uh, yeah, I'll give you Kafka's dates as well. So he was born in Prague in Austria, Hungary, 1883. Died in 1924 in Kierling, Austria. And if you've read any Kafka before, you probably know what to expect from this. I mean, I've only read The Metamorphosis. I think it was The Metamorphosis and other stories, to be fair, but still. And this kind of continues with that theme, because we basically have, you know, a human mind inside a dog's body. And the entire book is, is what it sounds like, investigations of a dog. It's this human mind investigating the dog's body. And I suppose understanding what makes a dog a dog, you know. What I will say is because it's Kafka, we have these super long uh, paragraphs. So, for example, here in the first three pages, look, we've got that, that, and all that. So that, so far, is two paragraphs. There we go. The second paragraph ends there on page four. I mean, we have pages like this where literally there is no... That is all one paragraph. It started before those two pages and ends after, which kind of makes it irritating to read. If you're the kind of person, like me, I tend to read a couple pages at a time and then stop at the end of a paragraph. And sometimes you can't do that with this. But that's just Kafka's writing style, you know. It also makes it difficult for me to tell which parts of this to actually read out. Um, I do want to read some of it, though, so you can get a feel for Kafka's writing style and for what the book's like. So uh, I'll read you this bit here. How can you hold their silence against others and keep silent yourself? Easy answer. Because I am a dog. 
basically like the others, tight shut, offering resistance to my own questions, rigid with fear. Am I, in fact, at least since I've become an adult, looking to dogdom for answers to my questions? Are my hopes so foolish? Do I see the foundations of our life and sense their depth, watch the workers on the site doing their grim work, and still expect that as far as my questions go, all that will be ended, torn down, abandoned? No, I really don't expect that anymore. With my questions, I am only chasing myself, driving myself on with a silence that is the only answer I get from all around me. How long do you think you can stand it that dogdom, which through your questions you are gradually bringing to consciousness, is silent and will always be silent? How long can you stand it? Beyond all individual questions, that is the question of questions for my life. It's been put specifically to me and troubles no one else. Unfortunately, I can answer it more easily than the detailed supplementary questions. I will presumably be able to stand it until my natural end. Old age is placid and gets better and better at withstanding the restless questioning. I will probably die in silence, surrounded by silence, a peaceful death, and I am almost reconciled to it. An admirably strong heart and lungs not to be worn out ahead of time, given to us dogs almost out of malice. We resist all questions, even our own, being the barricade of silence that we are. That there was a reference, by the way, to dogs, how they kind of go off to die by themselves. They don't want to be surrounded by people and or other dogs when they die. He says here, I am not a hair's breadth outside the doggish norm. Every dog has, as I do, the urge to question, and I, like all dogs, have the compulsion to be silent. All have the urge to ask questions. Could my questions otherwise have had the least effect, which I was fortunate enough to behold with delight, albeit greatly overstated delight? And the fact that I also have a compulsion to silence, that needs no particular support. Fundamentally then, I am not so different from any other dog, and that is why basically everyone will recognise me, and I them, despite the differences of opinion and taste that may exist between us. Only the proportion of the constituent element varies. To me personally, the difference is substantial, but in terms of the species as a whole, it is negligible. How should should the mixture of elements, either now or in the past, not have given rise to the likes of myself or even, if one wants to call the result unfortunate in my case, something still more unfortunate? Why, that would fly in the face of all experience. We dogs are busy in the most varied professions and callings, such professions as one would hardly credit if it wasn't that one had the most reliable information about them. What I think is interesting is you could actually just do a find and replace and take the word dog and change it to man, and I think that's what's so genius here is that Kafka kind of this whole thing is like a non-fiction essay about what makes a dog a dog but actually the same things that make a dog a dog are what make a man a man you know and we aren't we aren't so different I'm gonna read you this one last little bit that I highlighted here and then I will give you my rating so how do my fellow dogs help one another what kind of attempts do they make to live in spite of everything what do they look like there were probably different answers. I tried with my attempts at questioning while I was young. It might be an idea to stick to those who were given to asking questions themselves, and then I would have some company. For a time I tried that too, in spite of myself, because the ones that most bother me are the ones from whom I want answers. The ones who keep butting in with questions I usually can't answer are merely repulsive to me. Anyway, who doesn't like to ask questions while he's still young? How am I to find the right ones among the many, many questioners? One question sounds much like another. It's a matter of the intention behind it, which is often concealed even from the questioner. Anyway, questioning is an idiosyncrasy among dogs. They ask their questions all at once, as though to conceal the traces of the real questioner. No, I won't find a confederate among the questioners, the young ones, any more than I do among the silent ones and the old ones to whom I now belong. What's the point of questions anyway? I failed with them. Probably my fellow dogs are far cleverer than I am and apply different and excellent methods of their own for coping with this life. Methods, admittedly, that may be useful to them in appeasing or disguising who they are, may calm or lull or disguise what they are, but in general they will be just as ineffectual as mine because, look about me as I may, I see little sign of success in any quarter. I fear I will recognise a confederate by anything but success. It's almost philosophical and it's quite hard at times just to read because of the length of these paragraphs and the sentences you almost get to the end of the paragraph and you forgot how that paragraph started so you have to go back and and reread it having said that i mean i just think it raises a lot of interesting questions that i'm still trying to answer it's not mind-blowing but it is good i don't know how i would describe him he's like a cross between lewis carroll writing alice in wonderland and Sigmund Freud on the interpretation of dreams or something. <laughs> it's a really weird writing style that Kafka has that 
you just have to read him. You have to read some of his work once, I think. And if you're not going to read The Metamorphosis, I would say this is as good a place as any to start. So yeah, four out of five for me, and I did enjoy this one. I'm glad I read it. So there we have it. That's what I thought of Investigations of a Dog by Franz Kafka. Don't forget to let me know what you think in the comments. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to do a quick review of Daydream and Drunkenness of a Young Lady by Clarice Lispector. So this is Penguin Mini Modern number 15. I will read you the blurb. Three intoxicating tales of three women, their secret desires, fears, and madness from a giant of Brazilian literature. And here in the front, we have this quote here. Oh, what a succulent bedroom, which actually I do really like that quote. Unfortunately, I think that's probably the best part of the book. So the problem we have is I read this two days ago. What can I tell you about it? I can tell you absolutely nothing about it. I can't remember it at all. So that is a slight problem. I don't know exactly how I'm supposed to review it when I don't remember the damn thing. But at the same time, if, if I don't really remember it, that to me is a sign that it's not really worth remembering. So the three stories in this, we have Daydream and Drunkenness of a Young Lady, the title story, we have Love, and we have Family Ties. They're also actually all about the same length, which is quite unusual for these. Let me read you, I'm going to read you the opening paragraph of Daydream and Drunkenness of a Young Lady so you can get a feel for uh, Lispector's writing style. Throughout the room, it seemed to her the trams were crossing, making her reflection tremble. She sat combing her hair languorously before the three-way vanity, her white, strong arms bristling in the slight afternoon chill. Her eyes didn't leave themselves, the mirrors vibrated, now dark, now luminous. Outside, from an upper window, a heavy, soft thing fell to the street. Had the little ones and her husband been home, she'd have thought to blame their carelessness. Her eyes never pried themselves from her image, her comb working meditatively, her, bro her open robe revealing in the mirrors the intersecting breasts of several young ladies. So the author was born in Ukraine and died in Brazil, and I assume she wrote in Brazilian. It's translated by Katrina Dodson. I mean, it was just sort of supremely unrelatable to me as a reader, I guess. Even that start, the start of that story, that's a mum looking in a mirror. And I, I don't have kids, I hate kids. And I don't look in mirrors, I actually have a phobia of mirrors. Oh, so uh, one of the paragraphs that I marked out was this one. So, uh, Oh, how humiliating to have come to the tavern without a hat. Her head now felt naked. And that other one with her ladylike airs, pretending to be refined. I know just what you need, you little aristocrat, and your sallow man too. And if you think I'm jealous of you and your flat chest, I'll have you know that I don't give a toss. I don't give a bloody toss about your hats. Low-life floozies like you, playing hard to get, I'll slap them senseless. In her sacred wrath, she reached out her hand with difficulty and took a toothpick. Actually, that's it. That's one of the things that reminded me. There was a lot of woman-on-woman -woman hate in this. That was ba basically what I take from me is that is what this book is about. It's about it's about female jealousy of other women, I guess. It's also very complainy as well, especially this first story. So uh, let me read you out this paragraph as well. Well, since it'll happen anyway, I may as well open my eyes now, which she did, and everything became smaller and more distinct, though without any pain at all. Everything deep down was the same, just smaller and familiar. She was sitting quite tense on her bed, her stomach so full, absorbed, resigned, with the gentleness of someone waiting for someone else to wake up. You overstuff yourself and I end up paying the price, she said to herself melancholically, gazing at her little white toes. She looked around, patient, obedient. Oh, words, words, bedroom objects lined up in word order, forming those murky, bothersome sentences that whoever can read shall. Tiresome, tiresome, oh, what a bore, what a pain. Oh, well, woe is me, God's will be done, what could you do? Oh, I can hardly say what's happened to me, oh, well, God's will be done. And to think she'd had so much fun tonight, and to think it had been so good, and the restaurant so to her liking, sitting elegantly at the table. Table, the world, the world screamed at her, but she didn't even respond, shrugging her shoulders with a pouty tsk vexed don't come pestering me with caresses disillusioned resigned stuffed silly married content the vague nausea i don't know it just was really dull to read it was just like being complained at for number two for love i didn't make any notes on that story whatsoever so we have another thing which i get again i guess was relevant when it was written but it just doesn't it doesn't mean anything to me as a reader, especially somebody who doesn't want to get married. Whoever marries off a son loses a son. Whoever marries off a daughter gains a son, her mother had added. And Antonio took advantage of having the flu to cough. I don't know. It just doesn't seem relevant in a society in which I don't think... I don't understand why people still get married. I, I don't know. 
seems a lot of money to pay for a little mark, a little bit of paperwork. But that's just my view. And yeah, I think that's all I've got for this. The problem with, that we're getting now with these Penguin Mini Moderns is that I've read enough of them now that there's very little to say about them. If they're just forgettable, they're just forgettable. And this very much was forgettable. I assume... I don't know, I, I feel like maybe this is actually some kind of racist view maybe in my head, but the only reason I could understand why they would include this author in the collection is because she was born in the Ukraine, died in Brazil and wrote in presumably Brazilian or Spanish, it doesn't actually say. But that's the only reason why I can understand why you would include this in this box set of 50. Especially when there are some, like, for example, Asimov isn't in it. Graham Greene isn't in it. Like, Hemingway isn't in it. Maybe he's too well known, to be fair. But there are a lot of people, I think, should have been in this this box set. And I don't know why this is in there, to be honest. It was, uh, I'll give it a three out of five. It was, it was dull. And I won't be reading any more Clarice Lispector, but... Maybe some, maybe though, maybe somebody else will enjoy it more than I will. So who knows? So yeah, there we go. That's what I thought of Daydream and Drunkenness of a Young Lady. Don't forget to let me know in the comments what you think if you've read this book. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.